Uh, I'd like for you to please welcome Mark Fisher. Mark is the Chief Executive Officer uh, of the Council of the Great Lakes Region. Mark was appointed as CEO of the Council in 2014. He's a seasoned professional with 13 years of experience in policymaking, strategic business planning, corporate communications, stakeholder engagement, public advocacy, and uh, issues management. Uh, having known Mark since he took over the position, I've been really impressed at the thinking that he has done uh, to think about uh, and help set the, the path for this region uh, on a variety of fronts. So with that, Mark will now share his thoughts on the importance of the Great Lakes from an economic perspective. Mark, thank you. That's, uh, that's great, Cam. Thanks for that uh, kind in introduction. Um, I also want to take a minute to uh, thank Mike Goffin and, um, and his incredible team for putting on this event. Mike probably doesn't remember it, but I started my career working for in what was Environment Canada, uh, working on water issues uh, from a Canada-US context, and so I worked with Mike quite a lot when he was in the Great, La Great Lakes office, so it's amazing how, how your life can always come around uh, full circle, and there are so many other friendly uh, faces in the room that I've worked with over the years, so uh, kudos to, uh, to the team. Um, it's good to be with you here today. Um, I'd like to begin, as we, a uh, number of other speakers have, by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. Most recently is recognized as the territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. The name Toronto is thought to have come from the Haudenosaunee word Takranto. The, a 19th century European historian promoted the idea that the word means meeting place which would be wonderful if it was true. It turns out that Tarakaranto, I apologize for the pronunciation, is more accurately translated as where there are trees in water. But even if the translation is faulty, nothing stops us from looking at Toronto as a meeting place, because it is. Covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, this territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, if we heard uh, earlier about this morning. That's an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabeg and allied nations. It sets out a framework for these nations to work peaceably to share and care for the resources of the Great Lakes. Just think about that for a moment. Long before skyscrapers, expressways, and industries, long before international borders and trade agreements, the indigenous people who lived here recognized the specialness of this region and the need to protect it. It's a trust that extends to all of us who are fortunate enough to make our homes in this vast and vibrant region today. As CEO of the Council of the Great Lakes Region, it's a trust that I feel very passionate and strongly about. I grew up between the shores of Lake Ontario and Rice Lake in a town called Coburg, Ontario's feel-good town. As a child, I remember looking out at the lake and thinking how big it was. I remember wondering what could be on the other side. Who lived there? What did they do? Basic questions, I know. My work with the council, however, has shown me that the answers to these questions are anything but simple. Our core mission is to advocate for a stronger, more dynamic culture of collaboration in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence region. Eight states, two provinces, two countries, and over 15,000 cities and towns. In building not only a strong regional economy, but also in preserving our environment. After all, we are the economic heartland of North America and reside on one of the world's great and precious natural resources. At the Council, we believe that we should think regionally, that we should think about how the many and varied players on both sides of the border work together for our common benefit. This means business, labor, government, academia, environmentalists, trade groups, and community organizations. All of us, really, because we need to collectively recognize that nobody owns the whole of a problem. 107 million people live in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence region. You're going to see some different numbers because when I talk about the region from an economic standpoint, I capture the fullness of Ontario and Quebec and the eight Great Lakes states, not just the basin. In fact, if it were a nation, this region would be the 12th most populous world, uh, country in the world, more than Germany or Britain. What's more, last year this region produced about $5.8 trillion in economic activity. That's U.S. dollars. Only China and the United States are bigger among national economies. No two nations on earth trade more together than Canada and the United States, and half that trade happens in our region. 
A quarter of it passes over one spot. Any guesses? Ambassador Bridge. We are linked in so many ways. Our prosperity is shared. As GM created so many jobs over the decades in Michigan, it helped make Oshawa one of Canada's wealthiest cities. Every day, 5,000 nurses from Windsor commute across the border to care for parents, patients in hospitals, in Detroit hospitals. There are countless other stories that confirm not only our historical ties and our growing connected connectedness, all told, the manufacturing and services sectors support a staggering 50 million jobs. That's roughly a third of the combined American and Canadian workforce. We count on each other to build and maintain a quality of life that is the envy of the world. There were supposed to be some other slides ticking through here. I guess um, it wasn't set up. Um, and our two countries count on our region to power our respective economies. Yes, it's an economy in transition. But this region economy matters. We all need to understand that, and all of us need to work together to adapt and tackle our economic challenges head on. Take manufacturing. It remains a significant driver of the regional and national economies of Canada and the United States. Fueled by affordable and increasingly clean energy, making and exporting things is in our DNA. That's why 50% of Canadian manufacturing and roughly a quarter of American manufacturing is based here. What we all know has gone through some tough times of late. The fact of the matter is it's no longer realistic to expect lifelong employment on an assembly line following high school graduation. Whether we like it or not, technology is changing the model, meaning fewer workers to produce the same output. This does not mean there will not, not be manufacturing jobs in the future. It just means they will have different characteristics requiring different skill sets. Thicker borders and protectionist attitudes continue to hinder, hinder bilateral trade, even as the world becomes more interconnected. In fact, Ottawa estimates that border thickening measures cost the Canadian economy roughly $16 million a year, and that's a conservative estimate. Additionally, oh, sorry, these practices are choking and fragmenting our regional supply chains. Additionally, our infrastructure is aging at a time when public finances to renew them are increasingly constrained by debt. We've talked a lot about drinking water and wastewater. These are all critical assets that we need to renew. Fortunately, as we find solutions to these challenges, our economy is undergoing an important trans transformation, a renewal that has been aided significantly by a growing services sector like education and healthcare. As a matter of fact, according to BMO Capital Markets, these sectors alone have added 1.6 million jobs over the last 10 years. We are blessed with a priceless resource in addition to water, brain power. 19 of the top 100 universities in the world are Great Lakes institutions. As well, this region produces almost half of both countries' university graduates. These are the bright people who will lead us through times of profound change and lay the groundwork for the future. They have already produced an enormous amount of cutting edge research and innovation. In 2011, the American portion of the region accounted for 24% of the total R&D funding in the country. By comparison, nearly three quarters of the money spent in Canadian R&D was in Ontario and Quebec. From the autonomous vehicle to clean tech, solutions to some of the world's biggest problems are being discovered right here. In fact, Ontario has the second largest concentration of information and communications technology companies on the continent after California. Whether it is manufacturing sector in transition or the growing services sector, we live in an extremely dynamic region. It's industrious, it's innovative, and it's full of opportunity. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But in a globalized, technology-driven economy, change is constant. To be winners rather than victims in this new economy, we need to always be thinking ahead. We need to be constantly on the look for new ways of capitalizing and building on our core economic strengths. Above all, in today's climate of borderless trade and investment, we need an economic vision and strategy for the region. The competitiveness of Canada and the United States depends on us getting it right. There are hopeful signs. Ontario and Michigan are working together to promote the region as the world's greatest auto manufacturing region. Buffalo, Brock, McMaster Universities, along with the Hamilton Health Sciences, are working on our new research and innovation corridor. 
these examples are a start. But we can do more on so many levels. I've spoken a lot about the economy, which we cannot and must not divorce from the environment. Both must be healthy and sustainable. As stewards of the Great Lakes, however, we have not always treated this magnificent resource with the respect it deserves. Nor have we always taken the time to understand or appreciate their significance. There were some speakers yesterday that talked about the fact that we live beside 20% of the world's surface freshwater supply. But no one mentioned that only 1% of these waters are renewed each year by precipitation runoff in groundwater. That means that 99% of the water is glacial. The Great Lakes are a precious and finite resource requiring special attention to keep them swimmable, drinkable, and fishable. The region is a critical breeding ground and stopover for millions of migratory birds. Take the Great Scope, for example. It flies over 6,000 kilometers from the Arctic to winter in the Great Lakes. 6,000 kilometers. More than 3,500 species of plants and animals inhabit the basin, including one-fifth of all fish species in North America. We think of ourselves as urbanized, but almost half of the Great Lakes Basin, 42%, is covered with forests. These forests help clean our air, protect our streams and rivers, and provide critical habitat. Our landscapes are celebrated in song and poetry, as well as captured on canvas and camera. For generations, our Aboriginal leaders have reminded us of the sacredness of this land, as well as its water and its creatures. Yet, as we mark our achievements in preserving this great place, some very real big issues still exist. Microplastics, invasive species, sprawling development, legacy contaminants, agriculture and urban runoff. I think about these issues a lot. Particularly, I think about how we're going to balance the demands of environmental protection and economic growth. Take climate change as an example, the biggest challenge of our time. We know that. As a kid, I remember the steady rain and the predictable snowfalls in January and February. Today, a month's rain can fall in a day, flooding our sewers and drowning critical infrastructure. It just happened last week in Windsor and Detroit, and it's happening all too frequently. Droughts are on the rise to elevated temperature, due to elevated temperatures, stunting our crops and impacting our watersheds in unimaginable ways. Following decades of higher, higher than average water levels throughout the basin, levels across the Great Lakes fell dramatically in 1997. We know the story. Many scientists believe it was an unusually strong El Nino that was the trigger. For about 15 years afterwards, water levels in Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron were substantially below historic levels. These low water levels have serious ripple effects. If a laker that ships 65,000 tons of iron ore is 10,000 tons short so it can ply the waters of the Great Lakes, that's equivalent to roughly 6,000 tons of steel. Looked at it another way, that's enough steel to produce roughly 8,500 cars. Conversely, many species require very specific water levels and water temperature conditions in order to spawn and breed. Thankfully, the lakes have rebounded since. But what happens next and over the long term remains uncertain. What is certain is that climate change is too complex for us to solve independently. It demands collaboration across levels of government, disciplines, and sectors, and borders. It is this need that led to the creation of the Council of the Great Lakes Region. The idea, born in 2011 at the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Regional Summit in Windsor. The summit identified where stronger collaboration and voice were needed on a range of policy matters. Experts at the summit were equally clear about the gaps in regional leadership and knowledge sharing. We are one of the most important regions in the world, yet no one organization existed to bring diverse interests together. The Council of the Great Lakes Region, which operates as a binational nonprofit, was officially launched in 2013 in Cleveland to fill this critical void. Governed by an independent board of directors, it is modeled on the successful Pacific Northwestern Economic Region which has been around for 20 years. At its core, we are a gathering place for regional leaders to come together to share ideas and insights. Ideas and insights about building a strong economy, but also ideas and insights about how we protect the environment while creating jobs. So in a sense, we're trying to reconcile the traditional conflicts between the economy and the environment. Because in a region like ours, economic and environmental matters cannot be considered in isolation from the other. We are trying to find convergent in thought, convergent in conversations,
that lead to new relationships. The Council achieves this mandate by rigorously researching economic and environmental issues to inform public discussions and debates, by convening diverse perspectives at events like the Great Lakes Economic Forum to find common understanding, and we do it by offering solutions and strategies to government on how best to grow the economy safely and sustainably. By taking regional collaboration to a new level, the Council hopes to be a unifying force in a complex region. We hope to cultivate a stronger regional identity and voice. Canada's Governor General, His Excellency the Right Honourable David Johnson, put it very well last year in a speech at the first Great Lakes Economic Forum. He said, without a doubt the Great Lakes region is an ecosystem in the environmental sense. So why not conceive of this as an ecosystem when it comes to learning and innovating and prospering together? The arc of change is often long. Hard things are hard. Our Indigenous leaders tell us that we must think seven generations ahead when making decisions today. <laughs> I'd be happy if we could just look and plan beyond the typical four-year political cycle. Engaging in thoughtful, multidisciplinary conversations is a good starting point. Progress is a collective effort. The alternative, pitch partisan battles in protecting entrenched positions, achieves only this, noise and delay. We need to double down on data collection and improving our modeling capacity. And we need to use the power of analytics and cognitive computing to give us new insights and foresight in key areas, from becoming more efficient in using energy and growing food to optimizing the performance of our transportation network. Because if we are honest, our knowledge of this complex economic and environmental ecosystem is not where it should be. There is incredible enthusiasm and support for the conversations, insights, and convergence the Council is trying to seed. I encourage you to become a part of it. Collectively, we can create the most competitive, innovative, sustainable, and welcoming region in the world. Thank you. Miigwech.